Mr. Smith, you talked about the uh, increase in the number of African Americans who purchased firearms, including African American women, in the recent past. What do you attribute that to? Thank you for the question, uh, Senator. It, it's multifaceted, but the one overriding thing that I'm seeing from my perch as the president of the organization is that black women, like all Americans, feel that they need to be able to protect themselves. They're not waiting for some guy on a white horse to fly in and, and save them. They want to be able to protect themselves. If someone breaks into their home at 2 o'clock in the morning, they don't have the time to tell the robber or someone who's breaking their home, hold on, wait a second, let me call the police. They have to be able to deal with that threat right then and there, and that's what they're doing. Women in mass are taking upon themselves to be very independent and self-reliant, and they are purchasing firearms. Where do you live? I live outside of Atlanta, Georgia. Okay. Are you familiar with the fact that last year alone uh, there were 836 homicides in Chicago? I understand Chicago is a very uh, interesting place in terms of violence, yes. Do you have an opinion whether that violence is predominantly caused by criminal street gangs? I've talked about this many times in many conversations and interviews. If we're really serious about helping poor folks, and let's be specific, we're talking about poor black and brown folks, give them jobs, take away super incarceration of, of them at an earlier age where they have two or three felonies by the time they're 23 and 24 years of age, give them a, the ability to go out and secure employment. Those folks out there are doing what anyone else would do if you can't find a job. They'll sell drugs, they'll beat people up, they'll do whatever it takes to, to take care of those babies that they have at home, and they have kids at home. But we have to, as a, as a country, to, to save them is to do some, something other than say, well, those guys are bad, let's just throw them in jail, when again and again, more and more are coming like them. We have to think holistically to get a solution. And for me, my personal belief, and I'm not a, a scholar, like some of the folks on this, on this table, but I'm a black man who's 63 years of age, has been in this country for a long time. And if you give folks employment, if you give them a reason to buy into the American dream, like all of us have been able to, to do it to a certain extent in this room, you'll see dramatic changes in people's behaviors and what they believe and what they don't believe in. Thank you for your um, explanation of what an assault rifle is in reality. It is a semi-automatic rifle, correct? That is correct. And uh, is an AR-15 the only type of semi-automatic rifle on the market? There's a, a multitude of guns. I mean, there's so many manufacturers out there you know, building guns. It's, it's, you have a lot of choices. Um, but one thing I wanted to point out that, you, that I brought up in, my, in my, my statement, when you pull the trigger on a AR, it is no different when you pull the trigger on a pistol or shotgun. Only one bullet comes out. Well, that's an important point because I think a lot of people are under the misimpression that, uh, that it's an automatic weapon, for example. That is correct. In, in terms of the mechanism by which a semi-automatic rifle works, is it in principle any different from, let's say, a semi-automatic uh, pistol or other uh, semi-automatic weapon? The similarities are pretty, pretty even in terms of the, the and I'm not a, a gunsmith and I'm not a person that puts together guns, but when you buy a, a pistol, are you buying a, a shotgun? The mechanism to pull the trigger is relatively the same. One pull of the trigger will, reduce, will produce one bullet coming out of, the, out, of the, out of that particular gun. So if Congress were to take up the uh, suggestion of banning assault weapons, a semi-automatic weapon, is there any reason um, in principle why that same ban would not apply to other types of firearms? I'll say this, and I appreciate the answer, the question, Senator. I say this a lot to my folks. Gun rights and gun violence are two separate conversations and two separate events. But what happens when we have this deeply passionate conversation, we merge those two and we refuse to look at the nuances. To me, if we're really serious about helping folks stop looking at restriction after restriction after restriction, law after law after law after law, it's obvious. You can throw a hundred laws on that wall right there, and I can fill this room up with a whole bunch of folks that back my position. But we need to look at what's going to really solve the issue, and that's looking at the human condition. And that's what we're all failing to do in this room right now. People are hurting, people are scared, and people are in trouble. You're familiar, aren't you, with the fact that 60% of the gun deaths in America are suicides? 
Are you yes. aware of that? Sir? Yes, I am, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Hunter, how do assault weapons differ from other types of firearms? And do you believe a ban on assault weapons would be effective? Thank you. Thank you very much for the, the question. And uh, as a native Californian, uh, it's great to see you as, as well. Um, so when we talk about these weapons, there's a lot of discussion around semi-automatic versus automatic versus three round bursts. And that is, it refers to a firing mechanism. Right? Each time you pull the trigger, one bullet comes out. But there are far different characteristics uh, between different types of weapons. Shotguns, you pull trigger one time, one bullet comes out, very different type of round, very different muzzle velocity. So if we start just with there, and there is quite a bit of medical research that shows that the combination of the 223 or a 556 five, round, because a lot of this com does come from the military medical community as well, in combination with the muzzle velocity on these these weapons do a incredible amount of damage to the human body, and that's what they were designed to do. And that is substantially different than a nine millimeter round that was designed for a clean, clean entry kill type wound, as, decided, as opposed to a round that was designed to not just kill, but also maim and disable and disarm. And if you injure someone, have a far greater extent for injury, which is something that is good for combat but we're seeing it happen, happen here that we have. There's also some substantial differences of just the size and the creation of this rifle. It was designed to be lighter. If we look at the M16 as opposed to the M1, which was the previous service weapon, it, there's a three pound differential. So this is a lighter, more maneuverable weapon than several of the other hunting rifles that you, you might see there, that, that you commonly see. So when we, I think it's important that when we talk about weapons, we talk about more than just whether they are semi-automatic or fully automatic, because the, the caliber, the muzzle velocity, the weight, the maneuverability, all of these are characteristics of the weapons that are as important as well. Let's just be clear. We know the history of African-Americans and the entire history of this country being overwhelmingly the victims of horrific violence. Uh, from the killing of four girls in a bombing in Birmingham to the killing of Breonna Taylor asleep in her own house, from massacres that have happened like Tulsa, Oklahoma, including massacres like we saw in a church in South Carolina. You would agree about the natural instinct for communities to want to defend themselves like Black Panthers did in Oakland or in, as you're seeing with black women now, correct? Absolutely. So, so you and I also agree that that we need to, with urgency, end this kind of violence in the United States of America. You said that in your testimony. And so I want to point out some things that are out, I find outrageous that I actually think you probably find outrageous too. Mm -hmm. So the first is that we don't invest in community so violence doesn't happen in the first place. And something you said already, correct, like finding jobs. Number two, I, I introduced a bill called Break the, Silence, the, the Cycle of Violence Act that was included in the bipartisan compromise to do community violence intervention because from Oakland to New York City, there are strategies that are about empowering communities that actually lower violence. You really agree with me on that? Absolutely. You and I agree that most of the crimes happening in communities like ours, I'm the only senator, to my knowledge, that lives in a low-income black and brown community for the last 25 years. And what kills me is that Every single shooting when I was mayor, except for one that, I can, that we could find, happened with a person who was not qualified to buy a gun that was able to get that gun. You, you, you agree in general that's, that's the truth, right? Repeat that last part. That, that, that most of the crimes in communities like ours are happening because people who do not qualify to buy a gun, criminals, are, find a way to get a gun, correct? Absolutely, yes. Yeah, and so you and I would probably agree that this nation should have universal thorough background checks, correct? Yes, I, I, I support background checks. I, I know you do. Num number two, the, the, the trace data. When these crimes happen in communities like mine, the clearance rates on murders is so low that the communities are like, why can't we get the bad people behind? But yet we have laws that prevent people from doing research on trace data. You think that's absurd, yes? I would agree, yes. Yeah, thank you, thank you very much. 
Um, um, you don't have to hesitate so much. I'm not trying to trap you here. <laughs> no, it's okay. It's okay. Oh, okay. So, so here we, you and I, I could go down a long list of things right. that would make all of us safer that we don't do because friends of mine block us in this body that would make communities like yours and mine a lot safer. Correct? We can find bipartisan things that we could do today. Like take the ATF. It's the one law enforcement organization. We've increased budgets massively for every law enforcement, but we hand, we hand strap the, the ATF and don't allow them to do their job. We don't allow them to keep computer records of things that are going on. That's kind of absurd to stop law enforcement from doing their job, right? I, I think where you and I differ, and I see a lot of similarities. Especially haircut, but go ahead. <laughs> beautiful hair, beautiful hair. I think when it comes down to looking at, just be, let's be clear, I believe that having an AR-15 is a value add to my family. I, I, sir, I, I'll get to the era 15. I'm just trying to, to establish the foundation. We have commonality, sure, but there's, yeah. there's differences. There's yeah, but, but Americans have a lot of agreement on this issue, even folks that are Republican witness and some Democrat from Jersey. So, so let me just switch to one thing, though, that I take issue with, but turn to Hunter, and you can talk to me later. Sure. You said that pulling a trigger, AR-15, pulling a trigger, it's just one trigger. These are similar than a pistol or a shotgun. At the top of my block a few years ago, Shahad Smith was killed with an assault rifle. The police and my, uh, one of the police officers said to me, it was as if when that bullet hit him, his head exploded. Can you please explain for the record the difference between a one-shot pistol versus one of these assault weapons that are used in war zones? From a functional standpoint, there is no difference between a... I, 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 sir... I, but hold on, let, let, me, let me answer. You asked the question, let me answer. When you take a shotgun, an AR, or a rifle, it's a one-trigger system. Yes. Are some systems or some shotguns or rifles stronger than the others? Absolutely. But sure. the mechanics are the same. I don't disagree, I don't disagree yeah. with anything that you said. Everything okay. you said there is factual. So, but, but would you, Ms. Hunter, Dr. Hunter, excuse me, would you please explain? Uh, thank you very much. Uh, so this weapon was chosen by the United States Army in Vietnam because it was designed to shoot through a standard issue military helmet at 500 yards. It was designed to kill someone wearing a military helmet at 500 yards. So what that does to a civilian who's wearing nothing, a baseball cap, is liquefy organs. That is the intent of this round. Yes, one trigger pull, but this round, the way it was designed, was to do as much damage as quickly as possible and to kill enemy soldiers wearing a standard issue military helmet. So and I'm just going to close you because I'm, I'm out of time and I, and I want to ask the mayor, mayor to mayor a question. But that is the point. These bullets hit bodies and they liquefy organs. I, I have seen too many shootings in my community. The ones done with pistols, people are more likely to survive. The ones done with these guns, they cause unbelievable damage. It takes one pull of a trigger to fire a grenade one pull of a trigger to fire a pistol. There is a big difference between weapons of war and, and, and these weapons. Mayor, I, I, I have too much experience um, with seeing my children die. And God bless our police officers in the United States of America. I, I have not seen heroism except for in war periods about men and women running towards gunfire with no situational awareness. I, I, I'm not joking. When I meet, see one of my police officers, when I go home and do, I want to hug them because I know that every day they put on that uniform. If I was their family member, if I was the husband of a, of a police officer, you worry about them. And what your officers did, all the stories I hear, you should be so proud. And I'm sorry, though, that you have to feel that pride. What I don't think folks understand is the true devastation. We mourn the loss of life, and, and that is uncalculable. But when these traumatic events happen to a town, the true cost is so much greater. I've seen businesses close. I've seen people who are so traumatized that they hear a firework go off on the next 4th of July, and they die for cover. Could you just, closing, and then I'll return it to the chairperson, try to help people understand that the regularity of these mass shootings in our communities is doing a deeper damage than I think America can even understand. 
and that it is a matter of time that we're at the point now that mayors all around America, we know, we, we, I'm sorry, I'm, no, I'm a former mayor, we know that this is just a matter of time, that today we're talking about Highland Park. Now, tomorrow we could be talking about another town, another mosque, another, another grocery store, another church, another school. Could you please just try to capture that one more time? So I flew in with the mayor of Buffalo just by happenstance, and several of my surrounding region mayors are here with me today. And we all know it's not if, but when. And the pain of being in a 4th of July parade and getting that call and thinking, no, not us, not now, not today. And I don't know what we're going to do next 4th of July. I have people who tell me they will never go to a parade again. I have people who tell me we need to do the biggest parade ever. How do we reclaim normalcy in our community? I don't know. And I will be reaching out to the many mayors who called me in the hours, literally within an hour of this shooting, who have gone through this painful experience to say to them, how do we move forward? I've been in touch with several of them regularly. I don't know why this needs to be our new normal. I don't know why we need to live this way. And I frankly need a better explanation to the students who have to go back to the classroom in a month to be able to say to them, don't worry. We've got you. When I talk to students in my community, they all said to me, oh yeah, we knew this was coming, not from this particular instance, but every single one of them said, we've been waiting for this our whole lives. We've been training for this our whole lives. And they knew what to do, and they thought it would be at school. Heaven help us all. There's no way to live when you're living in this kind of fear. And I am so concerned, not just for my community, but for our country. This needs to stop. Thanks for watching, and if you haven't already, please consider subscribing to our channel. And while you're at it, please leave us a comment. Thank you for watching.